Today's lecture is about uh, alloys which are used at uh, very high temperatures. And there's a large variety of such alloys, but I'm going to focus on two particular aspects. Um, I'm going to go through the laws of thermodynamics to explain why we need to, uh, why we need to design ever more uh, tolerant materials at high temperatures. And can you tell me what are the properties we are looking for when we go to high temperatures? And when I talk about high temperatures, much greater than half the absolute melting temperature. So give me a few examples of the properties that we are looking for. Creep resistance, because obviously diffusion becomes rapid at high temperatures. Anything else? Yep. That's very good. So we want a very stable microstructure. Okay. So we'll just make a note of that. First of all, we want creep strength. We want stability of the microstructure, because we carefully design a microstructure. We don't want it to change very rapidly. Anything else? Well, you know, tungsten melts at 3,000 degrees centigrade, roughly. Why don't we use it at very high temperatures? I mean, we use it in, in the old-fashioned light bulbs, but it's surrounded by an inert gas inside a glass cylinder. Why don't we use it at, yeah? You need it not to burn or oxidize? It mustn't, uh, it must have oxidation and corrosion resistance at high temperatures. So oxidation and corrosion resistance. Because when we are burning fuels, they contain all sorts of impurities in them, which accelerate the corrosion rate. So these are the properties we are looking for. We may be looking for other properties as well. For example, density, if, if we are talking about uh, aircraft, or uh, reliability over many, many years, if we are talking about ground-based applications. Now, the reason why we need to go to very, uh, very strong materials at high temperatures, why we focus on very high temperatures, is really comes from the laws of thermodynamics. Now, laws of thermodynamics are empirical, but we know they work, okay? So, the fact that energy is conserved is the first law of thermodynamics. We don't have absolute proof that energy will be conserved, but all the observations we've made to date imply that energy is conserved. In other words, whatever you put into the system, you can't get more than that out of it. So if we burn a certain amount of coal, we can't gain more energy than the energy we release by burning the coal. So that's the first law of thermodynamics. The second law tells us that, you know, you basically can only break even if the lowest temperature in your cycle, operating cycle, is zero Kelvin. So if there is a cyclic process by which we are extracting energy, then in order to get 100% efficiency, this temperature has to be zero Kelvin. So this is the highest temperature of the cycle, this is the lowest temperature of the cycle, and that's zero Kelvin. Now obviously we have a working fluid, first of all, and we are not going to have a, a temperature which is lower than the freezing point of that working fluid. In the case of a power station, this would be steam. And the exit temperature of the steam would be of the order of 80 to 100 degrees centigrade. Uh, in the case of an aircraft engine, the exit temperature of the fluid uh, might be higher than 100 degrees centigrade. So there are practical limitations in getting to zero Kelvin. Now, supposing that we did have a fluid which operated happily at zero Kelvin. Then the third law of thermodynamics tells you that you can't actually reach absolute zero. So imagine that you have a mechanism by which you're extracting heat from a reservoir, okay? And that mechanism really removes a proportion of that heat. Then in every cycle, it can only remove a proportion of that heat not all of that heat, and therefore you can never actually reach absolute zero. So all of this means that whatever machine we design to generate electricity or to generate um, uh, thrust in an aircraft engine, 
we are never going to have 100% efficiency. And the only route that's open to us is to increase the highest temperature in the operating cycles. So can you give me some numbers? What do you think is the efficiency of electricity generator in a power plant? So a coal, all, all, coal or oil-fired power station or even a nuclear reactor because that drives a steam generator. What do you think is the efficiency in the UK? Take, take a guess. 40% uh, would be, uh, you're, you're not far off, OK? It's of the order of 50 to 60%. If you had gone back about 20 years ago, you're right. It would be of the order of 40%. And I will show you that the steam temperatures in power plant have been increasing rapidly as we develop more and more new materials. So there's an awful lot to be gained if we can improve that efficiency. Supposing we improve that efficiency by 10%, then we would, in one stroke, meet all of the requirements of the Kyoto Agreement, okay? So the CO2 reduction agreement. So this is a very, very big area of research and development, and I will give you a sort of flavor of what's going on, uh, and also introduce you to some of the theory that's involved in this. Now, just to give you a comparison between uh, aero engines and power plant, and you know, we also use aero engines to generate electricity on the ground by burning gas. So a gas turbine is basically like an aero engine, but it's based on the ground and it generates electricity by burning natural gas. So the conditions are extremely different. In an aero engine, the gas temperature might actually be 1400 degrees centigrade. The metal would have to sustain a temperature of the order of 1000 degrees centigrade or more. In a power plant, we are aiming for 700 to 750 degrees centigrade for the steam temperature. We haven't got anywhere near that. We are approximately 620 degrees centigrade in the most modern of power plants. Uh, and you'll understand why we can't go to higher temperatures very easily uh, as I go on into the lecture. Now, the pressures involved inside an air engine are about three atmospheres. Here, we are talking about very high pressures something approaching 400 atmospheres. And the combination of a very high temperature and high pressure is such that there is actually no difference between the liquid and gaseous states of water. So you've got to a point where it's basically one phase. Uh, the design life of an aero engine, uh, or at least of critical components in an aero engine, is of the order of 10 to the 4 hours, because after all, the aircraft engine is not working while you're on the ground. Yeah? So, the actual life may be greater than uh, 10,000 hours because 10,000 hours is just over a, over a year. But the flying time is of the order of 10 to the 4 hours before you have to start replacing certain components. Here we are talking about a minimum of 25 years. And there are power stations which, with some repairs, etc., have gone on for 40 years uh, of life. So whatever material you design has to last for much longer in a power plant. The, this is the stress uh, that the material is required to support after 100,000 hours. Okay. 100,000 hours of service uh, because the material degrades during service. So you may start off with a much stronger material, but it degrades during service. And you can see that the stress that an aero engine material would have to support is only 10 megapascals, whereas that is 100 megapascals. That seems low, but at high temperatures, these are very high stresses. With an aero engine, uh, you can afford to use expensive technologies, okay? Because you're talking about very small quantities, relatively small quantities of material. So there's a huge technology in coating the alloys so that we can prevent oxidation and corrosion at high temperatures. So most of the turbine blades that go into a jet engine, which are in the hot region of the engine, have coatings. And there are different kinds of coatings. There are uh, aluminum platinum compounds on the surface, followed by a ceramic coating, which is like a thermal barrier, so that the operating temperature is actually higher than the melting temperature of the metal. Uh, we can use cooling. Uh, through the channels inside the blade. When we were talking about investment casting, I explained that there are cooling channels inside the blade. 
Of course, that reduces efficiency. So we try not to use cooling in the case of the power plant components, uh, forced cooling. And in the case of aero engines, we can afford to use single crystal turbine blades. That's not generally the case for the very large components that we have in steam turbines. So these operating conditions are very different, and they demand different kinds of metallurgical and engineering technologies. And I will give you a clue about those. I'm beginning now with power stations. And this is one of my uh, former PhD students, Tracy Cool, who is about uh, 1.7 meters high. Okay. And that is a steam turbine. So you can see the scale of the operation. That this rotates at about 3,000 RPM for something like 30 years sustaining steam temperatures of up to 600 degrees centigrade. So this is a very, very critical component. If it breaks, there's such a huge amount of momentum that you, know, you would get huge lumps of steel flying all over the place. And this, this is just a rotating component, but there's a whole infrastructure which conveys the steam from the boilers, etc. And those uh, steam pipes have to also sustain uh, 30 years of life. So these, for example, are the very large uh, pipes which convey the steam from the boiler, and you have all these heat exchanger tubes and so on. And these are massive, massive pipes. So anything we can do to increase the strength of these pipes is a good thing, because not only do you make a better material, but you reduce the total weight here. And you can see that these pipes have a huge support structure around them. If we can reduce the weight of those pipes, then we can reduce also the support structure. So it's very important. The stresses from their weight alone are very large, okay? let alone the stresses from the high pressure steam inside the material. So just to give you an idea, you know, it, 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 as we move to better and better materials, we can actually reduce the wall thickness considerably and gain a lot, not simply by uh, you know, being able to put higher pressures and higher temperatures inside the pipe, but also the self-stress from the weight of the construction. Okay. So there are big advantages to making stronger materials which can survive at higher temperatures. So I've got to make this out of steel because, you know, the sort of alloys that you use in aero engines are, are almost worth their weight in silver. So I, I, I will show you what goes into them later on but they are far too expensive to make large constructions. So we make this out of steel. How can I make the steel resist creep deformation at high temperatures? Yeah, now creep deformation in this case uh, uh, is around 600 degrees centigrade, and there are different mechanisms of creep. You see, if we go to very high temperatures, then Diffusion even through the lattice contributes to creep, and that's why we have single crystal blades. But here we are talking about 600 degrees centigrade, and it's really the climb of dislocations over precipitates which controls the creep properties. So what I've got to do is I've got to fill this material with all kinds of precipitates to hinder the movement of those dislocations. And this is a, a, a transmission electron micrograph showing you, you know, a huge array of precipitates put into the steel. And these precipitates would be, generate, would be very stable. How, we have already discussed this. How can I make these precipitates extremely stable? You know, when we were talking about the tempering of martensite, what do you think these precipitates might be? Remember, it's going to operate at 600 degrees centigrade. So if we produce these by tempering martensite at 200 degrees centigrade, that's no good. So what kind of precipitates might these be? Alloy carbides. So for example, molybdenum carbides, chromium carbides, and a whole variety of very stable carbide phases generated by tempering at a very high temperature of maybe five or 600 degrees centigrade. So these are the secondary hardening steels that we discussed earlier. Now, 
this is, uh, this is a plot of the steam temperature versus the steam pressure, and this time it's in megapascals, and one megapascal is about 10 atmospheres of pressure. So here we are talking about 300 atmospheres of pressure. This is, this is the scenario for most of the power stations that exist in the USA at the moment, because they haven't invested in building new power stations. In Britain, we are somewhere around here. Okay, so we are, we are approaching 600 degrees centigrade. And Denmark is the world leader in the construction of the best power stations. And there is a very clear reason why. They have laws which say that there must be a certain amount of efficiency in power generation. Okay, so because there is legislation, you are forced to invest in making new power plant. And Denmark is the world leader with about 620 degrees centigrade. So if you are flying you know, to Copenhagen, as you land, you will see the most incredibly beautiful, beautiful looking power station right on the coastline. And that power station uh, operates with 620 degrees C steam temperature. But in certain parts of the power station, uh, we are using that as a test pad for brand new materials, which we hope will survive 700 degrees centigrade. So we've inserted components inside that power station through which steam goes at 700 degrees centigrade. And we are looking at the performance of those components. Of course, we can't use that steam because the rest of the power station can only cope with 620. So we then cool that steam and pass it through the rest of the power station. So if we can achieve 700 degrees centigrade steam temperatures, there will be a massive improvement in the efficiency of power generation. OK, uh, we, we listed here some of the properties needed for high temperature materials. And the creep strength we achieve basically by packing the material with all sorts of precipitates. It may not be just one kind of precipitate, but several kinds of precipitates. And we choose those uh, precipitates to give us a stable microstructure. But what do we mean by the stability of microstructure? Well, you know, if you take a froth of soap bubbles and you observe it, then those soap bubbles will get bigger and bigger with time because you're minimizing the total amount of surface per unit volume. In other words, you get coarsening. Okay. Now, similarly, with precipitates, you have an interface with the matrix, and that interface has an energy per unit area. The more interface you have, the less stable your material is. Okay? So that interface uh, drives the coarsening of precipitates, and the mechanism by which it drives it is as follows. So here is a plot of free energy versus chemical composition. This is my matrix, and this is a precipitate a large precipitate. And if I draw a common tangent, then this is the equilibrium composition in the matrix, which is in contact with the large precipitate. Okay. Now, if I have a smaller precipitate, then its free energy is going to be greater, because the total amount of surface per unit volume is larger. When you have a small particle, the contribution of the surface is greater. That's why we have an activation energy when you have to nucleate a particle. Yeah, is everybody happy with that, that a smaller particle will have a larger contribution from interface energy, right? So I have to raise the free energy curve of a small particle to this red position. And therefore, the equilibrium composition in the matrix changes. So the composition in the matrix, which is in equilibrium with a smaller particle, is greater than the composition in the matrix, which is in equilibrium with a larger particle. So here you have a large particle, here you have a small particle, and the matrix composition will be different. So you get a diffusion gradient, which causes the small particle to dissolve and the large particle to grow. Uh, the, the driving force for coarsening is simply the surface per unit volume. And if we assume a spherical precipitate, then the surface area is 4, four pi r squared, divided by volume, which is 4 upon 3 pi r cubed, and therefore, this is the driving force for coarsening. Okay? R, there, is the radius of the particle. If I multiply this by the interfacial energy per unit area, then that gives me the driving force for coarsening. Okay? So immediately, that tells you that if I have a smaller interfacial energy, then the coarsening rate will be smaller. 
Everyone happy with this, the mechanism of coarsening? Well, I can illustrate it better over here. So with the small particle here, I have a larger concentration in the matrix. With the large particle, the equilibrium concentration is smaller, and therefore I get a gradient of solute driving diffusion from the small particle to the large particle. Okay. And that is the mechanism of coarsening. So in order to reduce coarsening, obviously we've got to design precipitates which have a low interfacial energy. Okay. Uh, how can I get a low interfacial energy? I've got to ensure a certain amount of coherency between the matrix and the precipitate. If I have an incoherent interface, then that's a large interfacial energy. Okay. Any other ideas? How can I reduce, just from this, this diagram, how can I reduce the coarsening rate? Okay, so we've talked about interfacial energy. Clearly, the smaller the interfacial energy, the lower will be the coarsening rate. But if you look at this, okay, is there any way I can do something else to reduce the coarsening rate? What does the diffusion flux depend on? Yep. So obviously, you know, the larger the solubility of the solute in the matrix, the greater the gradient, uh, the, possible, the, the magnitude of the gradient that is possible. So if, if the solute has almost no solubility in the matrix, then it doesn't matter how small of a particle is, you cannot have a large gradient of concentration. Okay? So for example, there are materials in which we put yttrium oxide particles. And the reason why we put yttrium oxide is that oxygen has almost zero solubility in iron. So if you put those particles inside iron, then you will get no coarsening for very high temperatures and very long time periods. So we have to reduce this gradient. The other thing we can do is we can reduce the diffusion coefficient. Okay? So if, if I manipulate the composition of the matrix so that the diffusion coefficient of the solute decreases, then that's also a good thing. Uh, you remember when we did diffusion theory, the diffusion coefficient depends on the chemical potential gradient, and the chemical potential depends on all the other elements that are in solution. So by manipulating composition, I can also manipulate the diffusion coefficient. So three ways. One is that we reduce the interfacial energy by using particles which are, for example, coherent with the matrix. Of course, there is a problem that as the particles grow, you know, they coarsen, they will eventually become incoherent. And that's why all these materials have a certain life. We reduce diffusivity by controlling the composition of the matrix. And we choose precipitates which have a low solubility uh, in the matrix. So for example, I, I gave you the example of yttrium oxide. Oxygen has virtually zero solubility inside solid uh, iron. OK, so let's, let's apply this technology now to a different problem. We are going to look at these blades here, which are the blades which see very, very high temperatures. Okay, so these are the nickel-based, so-called nickel-based superalloys. Now, they basically are very, very simple. Uh, metallurgically, they are very simple systems. Okay, there are two phases inside nickel-based superalloys. One is called gamma and it is a disordered mixture of uh, the story I'm giving you now is oversimplified, and I'll go into a little bit more detail later, but let's assume that at the moment we only have nickel and, uh, nickel and aluminum. Okay. When these atoms are dispersed on these sites at random, okay, we, we say this is gamma. Can you tell me what the crystal structure here is? Yes, it's, it's cubic F or FCC. So we have nickel and aluminum atoms dispersed at random, a disordered phase. 
This, on the other hand, we have nickel atoms located at the centers of the faces and aluminum atoms at the corners. Now, you know that the atoms at the corners only count one-eighth. So if I take all the atoms at the corners, there's only one aluminum atom in that cell, and the atoms at the faces contribute half towards the cell, and we have six faces, so we have three nickel atoms. So this is Ni3Al. It's an intermetallic compound. L, and it's known as gamma prime. What is the crystal structure of gamma prime? Sorry? Cubic P. Cubic P. Uh, because no longer is the environment here the same as the environment here. So the motif here is different from the motif here. Here, we are talking about an average nickel aluminum atom located at each of the lattice points of cubic F. However, this is no longer a lattice point because it's different from this. Okay? So this is a primitive cubic crystal structure. But its lattice parameter is almost the same as the lattice parameter of this, and they tend to form in cube-cube orientation. That means with these axes parallel. Okay? The lattice parameters are almost the same, but they are not close enough. So what we do is we also add titanium to this, uh, and titanium goes into these aluminum sites. Okay, so we have Ni3Ti, and when we have both aluminum and titanium, we effectively have TiAl. Okay. Now the advantage of using both titanium and aluminum is that we can control the lattice parameter by changing the relative concentrations of aluminum and titanium. So by controlling that lattice parameter, you can make these two match rather nicely. So you get coherency. And the importance of coherency is that we reduce the coarsening rate. Okay? So it's a very clever system in which we have an ordered precipitate here, which is cubic P, and we use aluminum and titanium to control the lattice parameter so that it roughly matches the lattice parameter of the gamma at the temperature of operation. Okay? Now, if we have coherency, and if these precipitates are in cube-cube orientation, that means you know, the lattice planes are continuous across the interface between the gamma and gamma prime, then how do we get strengthening? Because we've tried to get the lattice parameters nearly the same, so coherency strains will be minimal. I mean, haven't we lost the advantage of strengthening using precipitates by making them fit so well? Well, the mechanism of strengthening here is quite different from anything you've done before, and it's as follows. So I've redrawn the unit cells, and this vector here is simply A by 2, 1, 1, 0, and it's a lattice vector. So this is the Burgers vector of a slip dislocation, and this is a 1, 1, 1 plane, which is a slip plane. Yeah. Nothing new. You've done this before. In cubic closed-back systems, the slip plane is 1, 1, 1, and the slip direction is A upon 2, 1, 1, 0, because that's a lattice vector. That's the shortest lattice vector. And when you get... When you go from one lattice point to another, you don't actually change the structure at all, and that's how slip happens. The Burgers vectors of dislocations are lattice vectors of the unit cell. Okay? So every, every, this is straightforward. This is something you've done before. Notice, however, that in the gamma prime, the lattice vector is no longer A by 2, 1, 1, 0. It's actually A, 1, 1, 0, because if I go from here to here, that will change the crystal structure. Okay. This is not a lattice point, and therefore my Burgers vector has to be double the size of the Burgers vector here. If I'm going to cause slip without disrupting the crystal structure, then my Burgers vector has to be double that in the gamma. Okay. Is everybody clear about that? Okay. So I'll explain that in a slightly different way. Here we are looking at an ordered crystal structure. 
And here is a, a schematic of an ordered crystal structure where we have two, two kinds of atoms. I'm going to now slip this, not by a lattice vector, but by the A by 2110. If I do that, then you can see I have disrupted the order. You know, here, the reason why we get ordering is because unlike atoms prefer to be next to each other, okay? What we've done by passing this A by 2110 is we've brought like atoms into contact. So we've actually created disorder when the system prefers to be ordered. However, if I now add another one of these dislocations, okay, so that the total deformation is A110, then I've restored the order. Now we have no like neighbors next to each other. So when I have a dislocation in the gamma, the matrix, and it wants to penetrate into the gamma prime, it can't do so. It has to wait for another A by 2110 so that it can form this super dislocation, which has a total Burgers vector of A110 to penetrate into the gamma prime. And that is what causes hardening. We have what's known as order hardening. That means in order for matrix dislocations to penetrate into the gamma prime, they have to form a pair with a total Burgers vector of a110. So this is called order hardening. And it's the disruption of order which requires the creation of these super dislocations. Now, of course, these two dislocations repel each other because they have uh, identical Burgers vectors. You know, they've got extra half planes and, you know, they, they have exactly the same sign. Therefore, they repel each other. What holds them together is that in between these dislocations, you have this region of disorder. So that, that region is called an antiphase domain boundary. Okay. So here you have one half of a super dislocation, which is A by 2, 1, 1, 0, and another one, A by 2, 1, 1, 0. And in between, of course, you have disrupted the order because the movement of the first dislocation destroys the order. The movement of the second one recreates it. They repel each other, but as they go apart, you are creating greater and greater disorder, so that holds them at an equilibrium separation. And this region is known as an antiphase domain boundary because it's a surface between two lines. Okay? So an antiphase. domain boundary. And you can see it in a transmission electron microscope. Now, there, there is uh, another contribution to hardening, and that is that the, the elastic modulus of the gamma prime is different from the elastic modulus of the gamma. So when a dislocation enters the gamma prime, its energy changes because, as you know, the energy of a dislocation varies with the modulus times the Burgers vector squared. Okay. Here is a, a particular superalloy which has a very small fraction of gamma prime, only about 0 0.1 uh, volume uh, fraction of gamma prime. And these particles are spherical. You can hardly see them. Okay, here, for example. And you can see these dislocation loops forming because they are finding it difficult to penetrate those gamma prime particles. So this is a real hardening effect. All these circles that you see is the dislocation trying to get past these gamma prime particles. But a volume fraction of 0 0.1 is too small. Yeah, we, we really need much more to get the high temperature properties. And a typical nickel-based superalloy will contain 70% gamma prime. So it's really full of precipitates. This is the dislocation structure. You can see there are pairs of dislocation inside the gamma prime. And in between, you have the antiphase domain boundary, where you have disrupted the order. Okay? So instead of seeing single dislocations with a Burgers vector of A upon 2110, you actually see pairs of dislocations when you look using uh, an electron microscope, transmission electron microscope, inside the gamma prime. 
Incidentally, this also applies to the aluminum lithium alloys that we did in the last lecture because it, it's an analogous system. You have Al3Li in a disordered matrix of Al-Li. So this, this is what uh, the structure of uh, one of those turbine blades in the hot end of the engine looks like. We have about 70% of gamma prime. This doesn't look like 70%. It looks a lot more than 70% because we are looking through a lump of material. So there's a lot of overlap of information. Okay? But you can measure this accurately using many methods, and it's about 70% of gamma prime. Now, this gamma prime itself is interesting, and a very large amount of research was done about 10 years ago on seeing whether we can make uh, high temperature materials out of pure gamma prime. That means just the ordered phase. You know, supposing we eliminate the matrix altogether and we just look at Ni3Al or Ni3AlTi. And the reason for looking at that particular um, intermetallic compound is that the strength of that actually increases with temperature. Okay? Um, now, before I go on to describe that, uh, I just wanted to show you the real complexity of a nickel-based superalloy. It isn't just nickel, aluminum, and titanium. There are at least 20 different elements deliberately added. You don't need to remember any of this, but I think you should have an idea that the problem is actually much more complicated. We have all of these elements added. You know, you have molybdenum, chromium, cobalt, iron, uh, rhenium, ruthenium, extremely expensive elements. The, these are incredibly expensive. Tantalum, niobium, vanadium, etc. Apart from the gamma prime, we also have a variety of precipitates depending on the kind of superalloy we are dealing with. We may, uh, if we are using polycrystalline superalloys, we've also got to strengthen the grain boundaries, and then we've got to coat the material as well. So the real problem is far more complicated than I've described, but the essence of the strengthening mechanisms uh, are, are correct. So I was mentioning that you know, there was a lot of work done on creating 100% you know, gamma prime alloy. We removed the matrix altogether. And the reason is that you know, its strength is maintained as you go to high temperatures. Okay, so normally, the strength decreases as you increase the temperature. Here, the strength is actually being maintained or increases in some cases as you raise the temperature. And the reason is, you know, although the normal slip occurs on the 111 planes of gamma prime, as you raise the tem temperature, the fault energy on the 100 plane decreases. So the dislocations tend to cross slip from the 111 to the 100 plane. And in doing so, they get into trouble because you know, you've got an intersection between planes, and part of the dislocation lies on the 111 plane, another part on the 100 plane, and that makes it difficult for it to move. Yeah? You know, if, if, if you've got a dislocation with a fault in between, and a part of it is on the 100 plane, and another part on 111, it clearly finds it difficult to move. So as it cross slips onto the 100 plane, you maintain the strength because it becomes difficult for it to be mobile. Unfortunately, uh, these alloys, uh, pure gamma prime alloys, are extremely sensitive to impurities. And therefore, their ductility can be very poor in commercial circumstances. So in a laboratory, we can make them incredibly pure and get lots of ductility. But in real life, that's not possible. So all, all that uh, research in that sense didn't succeed. You know, it didn't succeed in producing a material which is commercially viable. But in the process, uh, a lot of other intermetallic compounds were examined. And before I describe those to you, can you just make a correction to your notes? OK, on page 77, uh, this and should not be there. Okay, otherwise, the sentence is confusing to read. OK, so just cancel out the end. <clears throat> 
so I'm now going to describe to you the titanium aluminides. And these have a, a real chance of becoming extremely successful materials. And why would we be interested in these? Well, first of all, titanium has a low density. Aluminium has an even lower density. Okay, so we're talking about titanium having a density of about 4.5 grams per centimeter cubed. Aluminium is even lower. Combine the two and you've got a nice material with a low density. Compare that with a nickel-based superalloy, which has a density approaching nine grams per centimeter cubed. So if you, if you want to make things uh, which have to take off, then it's really a huge advantage to have lighter materials. So these intermetallic compounds are not only strong, but they actually are, have a much lower density. So all the stresses on, the, for example, the disc which holds the turbine blades together are reduced. And in the titanium system, there are two interesting intermetallic compounds. The first one is an ordered hexagonal phase, Ti3AL, which we call alpha-2. Uh, and the other one is the TIAL gamma, which has a structure like this. Okay? Again, you don't need to remember uh, anything about this particular crystal structure. It's, it's a particular crystal structure of titanium aluminide. This is actually tetragonal, and you can see that it's an ordered phase. So this is TIAL in the gamma structure, and uh, a more complicated ordered hexagonal TI3AL alpha-2. Uh, normally, the properties of the individual intermetallic compounds are not good. So if you just take TIAL on its own, or TI3AL, uh, then the ductility is, is quite low. But if you combine them to make effectively a, a, a natural composite, so we have, you know, almost like perlite, we have alternating lamellae of the TIAL and TIAL3, then the properties improve. So th this is the microstructure which is causing the excitement. We can naturally generate this. This is not made artificially. We have alternating layers of the alpha 2 and gamma. And although the ductility isn't terribly impressive, you know, compared with the nickel-based superalloys or with steels, it's sufficient for engineering purposes. And combine that with the very low density compared with all the other high temperature alloys, uh, this will definitely be making it into aircraft engines within the next few years. So they're already in test engines, okay? And you need to do this in test engines because of certification and safety and reliability issues, but they look very promising. And they will soon be making it into aircraft engines. Now, of course, uh, there are many other applications you can make of the titanium aluminides, and this is al already commercial. This is a turbocharger, which goes into high-performance uh, uh, cars, okay? Uh, normally, they are made from ceramics, which are very expensive to make. Now, you can buy them out of the gamma titanium aluminides. So they operate at very high temperatures and also spin very, very fast. Of course, I wouldn't recommend that you buy these high-performance cars because they are extremely polluting. Okay, so that's the end of the lecture, and I hope you have enjoyed this course. There's a lot more in part two if you do part two, okay? Thank you very much.